Um, so welcome to workshop number 146, Anonymity by Design, um, protecting, what was it again? Anonymity by Design, well, you'll see protecting the title. Pr protecting while I had protecting, and I forgot the last two words on my notes. I'm sorry. Protecting while connecting, and it's co-sponsored by the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, which is based here at the IGF, and very, we're very happy also with collaboration from the Pirate Party Movement of Turkey. And what we're going to do today is to examine, particularly in the form of case studies, so that you can get some detail, um, ways in which anonymous online communication protects and must indeed protect fundamental rights and freedoms, including the right to privacy and freedom of expression, as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the um, International Covenant of Civil Rights, ICCPR, I can never say the whole thing, ensuing covenants, and the European Convention on Human Rights, which of course were written for the offline world. But as we know, the fact that these rights in the offline world are now legitimately need to be protected and enjoyed in the online world has been confirmed by the United Nations Human Rights Council. Um, our concerns today are also articulated in the uh, IRPC's Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet, which we have here in Turkish and English for you, and Arabic, with our apologies for the um, problematic binding, and we have it also available in Spanish and German, with Indonesian and Portuguese on its way. The point being, this is what our sh workshop is about today, anonymity by design, protecting while connecting. So I look forward to a great discussion. We have a highly um, expert panel, and I think we have a highly expert audience. Allow me to introduce myself, then the panelists, and then very briefly tell you how we hope to run this um, session. My name is Marianne Franklin. I am together with Robert Bodel on my left-hand side, co-chair of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition uh, for the moment, because I'm the outgoing co-chair of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. Um, and I'm also a professor of global media and politics at Goldsmiths College in London. We all have multiple identities here. Now, uh, Robert will open the uh, session and frame our debate for today, and then he will be followed by uh, Ms. Sophie Kwasny, who is head of the Data Protection Unit at the Council of Europe. Our third speaker will be uh, Miriam Mazuki, who is at the um, Sorbonne University, CNRS, and UPMC. And number four will be um, Sehat Koch, who will be speaking for the uh, Pirate Party Turkey. Uh, Sehat is also a practicing IT lawyer, so you'll have a lot to say there. And that's number four. And number five, we're very thrilled to have a member of the Youth IGF project, Harriet Kempson, who is technically and officially a young person. So um, welcome, Harriet. We will have your wisdom with us today. And then number six, so you've got plenty of time to think, Nadine. <laughs> it's Nadine Mawad, if I pronounce that correctly, from the a APC um, Erotics Project. And last but not least, Tapani Tavainen from uh, the Electronic Foundation Finland, and also a stalwart member of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. And uh, I welcome you all today. So the idea is for your first intervention panelist, if you can, keep it to three minutes, you know. Um, I will try not to have to cut you off. And there will be time for you to return to details and further discussion as we proceed. Is that okay with everybody? So, okay. So let us begin with Robert Bodel. Thank you, Robert. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this is terrific. Um, so my name is Robert Bodel, co-chair of the IRPC, along with Marion, and associate professor of communication and new media studies um, at Mount St. Joseph University and adjunct professor at Miami University, Ohio, USA. The intention of this talk is to make a case of my talk is to make a case for online anonymity as a fundamental human right to be valued and protected as an important enabler of other rights in instrumental good. So what I'm setting out to do is to try and create a new consensus around anonymity. That would be my goal. Uh, 
anonymity is articulated, the, the right to anonymity is articulated in the IRP Charter, which is rooted in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, transposed to the digital network sphere by the Charter. And these rights in the Charter include Clause 3, the right to liberty and security on the internet. Clause 7, freedom of assembly and association. Clause 8, right to privacy on the internet, especially subsection E, right to anonymity and to use encryption. As well as Clause 9, right to digital data protection. The problem is that the possibility of online anonymity is disappearing and secure communication is becoming more and more difficult to achieve. We are all living in a mass surveillance society where the default online is persistent user identification. And the cards are stacked against anonymity due to many factors including dragnet government surveillance, the prolifer prol proliferation of spyware, state-sponsored de-encryption efforts, which coincides with dominant business models online of tracking and collect collecting people's communication and navigation uh, to sell for third to third parties as user data. Uh, to target ads and personalized content, which has negative implications for censorship, social segmentation, and political polarization. We also, another card that's stacked against anonymity is user practices on social networks, which privilege attention seeking, fame, and sameness which recent studies show mitigates against sharing political views on current events for fear of deviating from dominant views of one's social graph or one's sum total of connections, known within communication studies as the spiral of silence. And finally, the last card that's stacked is uh, biased mainstream reporting on an anonymity, which either focuses on the moral panic related to cyberbullying, cybercrime, and cyberterrorism, or maligns activist uses of anonymity known as the protest paradigm that dismisses hacktivists' uses of anonymity, which is a, a valid form of nonviolent civil disobedience. So if secure communication and online anonymity is disappearing and the online environment is fraught with pervasive monitoring supported by people's own online behavior and attitudes, why should anonymity exist in the first place? What is the value and necessity of online an anonymity? Why should it be protected in both regulation and governance of the internet? There are many ways to answer this. One is to look at the role of anonymity as an enabler of other fundamental rights such as privacy, freedom of expression. Another way to answer this is to provide evidence-based support of the uses and affordances of anonymity. So let's first, let me just summarize anonymity as a right. The ability to speak anonymously has traditionally been under understood as enabling broader democratic rights in the U.S. Constitution and Supreme Court. Uh, to quote McIntyre versus Ohio Elections Commission, a sh anonymity is a shield from the tyranny of the majority. And it is similar, similarly interpreted in the digital context by the Council of Europe's Declaration on Freedom of Communication on the Internet. Uh, and in a report to the UN General Assembly, Frank LaRue, a special rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression, testifies that, quote, indeed, throughout history, people's willingness to engage in debate on controversial subjects in the public sphere has always been linked to possibilities for doing so anonymously, end quote. In regards to the right to privacy, and according to LaRue's framework, the right to anonymity must be protected and the state must not regularly track human rights, defenders, activists, or opposition members. So the loss of anonymity and pseudonymity in online spaces has a chilling effect on freedom of expression, undermines privacy, and threatens people's lives. So another way to answer this question or to create, uh, perhaps build a new consensus uh, in support of the value of ne and necessity of anonymity is looking at the uses and affordances of anonymity. Some affordances, uh, studies show, that Anonymity affords minimal accountability, which encourages people to take risks, try new things, explore ideas, develop arguments, and express themselves. Anonymity also provides safety from fear of reprisal and ridicule, which enables vulnerable, vulnerable and marginalized groups to participate without others getting at them. 
Also, safety from public exposure encourages people to reach out for help, advice, and consolation. Evidence supports that another affordance, which counters the civilizing effect of identification theory, suggests that anonymity is not a cause of incivility online, as many claim, and an example of that would be hate speech, but that people are rude with or without using their real names, and offensive speech is often moderated by online experience not by using real names. A common misunderstanding is that anonymous online communication encourages people to lie, misrepresent, and deceive. Yet research finds the opposite to be true, that the internet's relative anonymity makes people more inclined to disclose honestly. Anonymity can encourage honest self-disclosure and be a liberating experience, especially for those who are socially anxious, lonely, and stigmatized. The affordance of disinhibition can allow people to speak freely, spontaneously, and candidly about things, enabling intimacy. This may also lead to empowered and uninhibited public opinion. There are many affordances that anonymity enables, as well as rights and uses. These studies of the affordances have found to be contributing factors that enable freedom of expression, community building, and collective action, and enable important uses, including whistleblowing to fight government abuse and corporate malfeasance, investigative reporting, which relies on the protection of the confidentiality of their sources, and pro-democracy activism and human rights defenders who require safety from reprisal. The point of this talk is to argue for a new consensus to support anonymity as a fundamental right that enables other rights and freedoms. We need a sea change, a cognitive shift that recognizes the value of and necessity of anonymous and secure communication online. In practical terms, we also need capacity building, technical competency, competency in the uses and practices of secure and anonymous communication. But beyond this, we need to mainstream these tools and practices for everyone and reduce the technical complexity of anonymous and privacy-aware tools and applications. We need to make anonymity the default and identification a choice, not the opposite. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. You've set the, you set the standard for us, and thanks for framing the debate so uh, coherently for us. I just want to note that the, if you're tweeting, uh, hashtag net rights and at net rights, just to keep um, our, our remote participants uh, informed. Thank you. I'm now going to turn to Sophie Kwasny from the, head of, from the Council of Europe, Head of Data Protection. Kwasny, please. Thank you. Yeah, good, good morning to all. Thank is it working? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you to all. Um, so I was I was earlier on on, uh, on another panel on the right to be forgotten, uh, where uh, it was very difficult as a Council of Europe representative to have a right to privacy on the one hand and right to freedom of expression on the other hand uh, opposed in this uh, sensitive topic. So here I'm glad that those two rights, fundamental freedom, here on this topic today, anonymity are brought together uh, because anonymity is as serving to the right of privacy uh, as it is uh, to the right to freedom of expression. Um, but still, as a Council of Europe representative, it is not that easy. Uh, both of those rights are not uh, absolute rights. Uh, they have limits, and uh, in particular for the prevention uh, and repression of crime. Uh, so while the Council of Europe uh, is promoting uh, and defending human rights, uh, there are limits. And this is reflected uh, in our work and on this particular topic. Uh, we have made some progress. I think it's good to acknowledge that, uh, as you said, there is a declaration of the Committee of Ministers uh, that uh, uh, calls for uh, the protection of anonymity. 
but in our, in our text, you always see uh, this double side and the limit uh, that has to be brought. Um, so I would like to uh, um, point out to you the, a recent guide to human rights for internet users uh, that has been adopted by our committee of ministers. So it's a legally, uh, it's, a, it's a legal instrument. Um, it was uh, adopted in April. And there you see uh, that anonymity uh, figures indeed under freedom of expression and information. It's the paragraph six of this guide, uh, which says that you may choose not to disclose your identity online, for instance, by using a pseudonym, affirmation. Then this, uh, this uh, um, um, how do you say it? Uh, the fact that indeed the right can be limited. Uh, the, the guide says, have, however, you should be aware that measures can be taken by national authorities which might lead to your identity being revealed. So that's the first part where we have the anonymity uh, being mentioned in this guide on, uh, on human rights. Uh, you also have it under the uh, right to private life uh, uh, data protection part of the guide. And there it goes uh, also even further. Um, it refers to a recommendation that our Committee of Ministers uh, adopted in 2012 uh, on the protection of human rights with regard to search engines. And there, uh, um, there is a recommendation that is done uh, to protect the data security against unlawful access to users' personal data by third parties, including end-to-end -end encryption of communication between the user and social networks. So there again, I think it was really uh, a very good position taken by the, by the Committee of Ministers in that text. That was in 2012. It's been again uh, recalled in the guide uh, for internet users. Um, another uh, also aspect that uh, the, the recommendation uh, dealing with search engines um, uh, uh, highlighted uh, was the fact that uh, to exercise your online uh, identity, you should be able uh, to use a pseudonym. And I'm sorry I referred to the search engine recommendation when it's about the social network, so my mistake. So as a social uh, network user, I should be uh, able to use a pseudonym. Um, there again, this text makes the reference to the limit, and the limit actually uh, comes uh, and has been clearly uh, stated in the decision uh, of the court, of the Strasbourg court. Uh, it's the case KU against Finland, uh, where there the, the problem of precisely not being able to identify the perpetrator of a crime uh, was, was uh, uh, a difficulty. Uh, my last point may be, uh, for the Council of Europe, we also have a key instrument, which is the cyber Crime Convention, uh, and I would like to highlight that uh, uh, in the explanatory report of the uh, Cybercrime Convention, uh, the anon anonymous tools are not uh, meant to be uh, criminalized. So I will just read the, the text. The modification of traffic data for the purpose of facilitating anonymous communications or modification of data for the purpose of secure communication, that is encryption, should in principle be considered a legitimate protection of privacy and therefore be considered as being undertaken with right. Um, so those are my introductory comments. Thank you very much. Important point about in practice that there's always limitations. Uh, dreams may be free, but practice is often more complex. Nonetheless, these rights do exist. So we're going to move to our, our third speaker. I might at some point um, ask for some audience questions, just so we get a sense of what concerns you, and then we can perhaps approach those questions at the end of the panel. So if you have any burning questions for this first three or four speakers, um, let us know. We'll have a brief moment. Not right now. Can you just hold it, <laughs> because I would like to move, whilst we're in this thematic area, to Miriam Mazuki. Thank you, Miriam. Um, it's, a, it's a loose three minutes, but I will be giving you um, significant looks at certain points if need be. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. And actually, I myself have uh, rather questions to ask than uh, uh, answers or uh, ready solutions to, to propose. And uh, to illustrate this, uh, question, I would like to, to start with two uh, 
quick example and recent uh, example. First example is that uh, this summer uh, we learned that two young uh, jihadists from Birmingham in the UK who admitted after one year in Syria uh, fighting jihad, who admitted uh, fighting uh, jihad uh, so in Syria. And uh, the, uh, we, we also learned that before uh, leaving uh, for Syria, they uh, bought on Amazon website uh, the bo uh, two books. Uh, first one is Arabic for Dummies, and the second book is the Quran for uh, Dummies from Amazon uh, website just before leaving for jihad in Syria. I'm not going to comment uh, here the absurdity of uh, their acts, nor uh, their insanity. Of course, it's not the topic uh, uh, today. But simply, I want to highlight uh, the fact that first, this kind of investigation on what they bought just before going to, to Jihad was made by the law enforcement uh, authority. And second, that this kind of investigation was successful in that the information was indeed uh, easily obtained by, uh, by Amazon because the data were available more than one year after the purchase of uh, the book on uh, Amazon uh, website. Uh, the second uh, illustrative uh, example that I would like to use is uh, very re recent because some days ago only it was reported that Egyptian police was using Grinder, which, which is an application, a mobile application uh, for a uh, dating application for gays, uh, it's so called a gay radar. To, and the, the Egyptian police was uh, using this app to hunt on uh, Egyptians, uh, gays and, uh, and lesbians and arrest them. So this, is, this report dates back only uh, some days ago. And this news illustrates the danger uh, posed by uh, tools and services uh, based on geolocation, to, because the, the, the whole idea is to find whether there is uh, other gay people around you when you are in some place at a cafe or so. So these tools and services are very dangerous because they are based on ge geolocation and uh, this is a, a, an important danger for the users of, uh, of these tools. Mm -hmm. By the way, the same happened, uh, the use of this app by the police, the same happened in Iran where um, approximately 200 gays and lesbian uh, uh, people Grinder users were uh, arrested. So these two examples, and I'm sure there are much more of them, uh, illustrate how uh, electronic commerce, in the case of uh, Amazon, as well as social networking users, applications, and services are challenging the uh, anonymity uh, issue. Since the Snowden re revelation uh, uh, last year, the NSA surveillance uh, scandal has rightly, I would say, but has been one of the main discussion topics, including here at IGF last year and this year uh, also. But today I would like to insist on the fact that you cannot see the forest for the tree, and we shouldn't discuss the issue of surveillance and others, uh, other violations of the right to privacy, of which anonymity should be a main component through the sole NSA prism. First of all, <coughs> sorry, first of all, we shouldn't forget about corporate uh, firms uh, online uh, tracking of internet users for behavioral advertisement purposes and for uh, profit uh, making, of course. And this concerns first and foremost e-commerce services, search engines, social networks, and other cloud-based services. 
Secondly, we shouldn't forget also about surveillance, not only for intelligence purposes, but also for law enforcement uh, purposes, where uh, most governments uh, around the world have adopted at national levels level uh, laws allowing them to conduct massive and systematic collection of communication and traffic data, for instance, through the data retention laws. And we know that we know that this data uh, allow for the mapping of citizens' online activities and their personal uh, uh, relationships. And uh, third, uh, thirdly, it becomes um, very clear now that there is a strong convergence between the methods and algorithm for a data mining and behavioral analy analysis used on the one hand by corporations for commercial benefits and on the other hand by law enforcement authority for policing and security objectives. Both are more and more relying on profiling and geolocation location to fulfill their objectives. So now, um, in conclusion, I will ask my two questions. Given these, all these development, I really would like to raise now two questions for uh, our discussion. First question is, should we stick to an understanding of anonymity with respect to simply the identity of a person, or rather uh, to, uh, with respect to an extended, a more extended set of data and behaviors that can be used to profile groups and eventually persons as members or as potential members of this uh, group. And my second question, and I will be finished, how should we deal with social networking applications individually and collectively when the very benefit as a user, the very benefit of such applications uh, resides in identifying others with whom we would like to interact? How could we be anonymous if we want to find uh, other like-minded people, like behaving people, etc. In other words, uh, to conclude, don't we ipso facto uh, consent to give away any right or simply any possibility of anonymity when using these services? I don't have any answer to this question. I'm not sure there is one, but I will let that to you to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. Very important questions. Uh, perhaps to do with, is it a question of an either or choice or different scenarios that are technical and social, intimate and public? So let's keep those questions in mind. I'm going to go, I'm going to move now to uh, Sehat Koch. You ready, Sehat? And yes. then we'll have a brief interlude just to co collect some questions from the audience. And we'll collect those questions, and if you don't mind, we'll then proceed with the last three speakers. Is that okay? Because I think we've all got responses and questions. So, Sehad Koch, the floor is yours for the next few minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And do I have three minutes? Yes. <laughs> okay. In fact, I want to talk about Gizpar protest, but maybe you uh, heard about it so much Gezi Park for saving 2003 June in Istanbul. Lots of people were in the streets, tried to save a park from the government's proceedings, and lots of things happened. People were uh, dead and injured, and after that, uh, of course, during these Gezi Park protests, everybody organized on internet, like in the other countries, in Arab like our Arab countries, and after that, uh, many users received suspended sentences and fines for only their social media activity in Turkey, and usually on charges related to terrorism or criticism of the state and its officials. Uh, even uh, well-known people. Uh, was given suspended sentences and court supervision for insulting religious values with their tweets because we were just uh, tweeting or retweeting the others' uh, peaceful opinions and not uh, calling for violence or insulting anyone. 
So I think that personally, as a lawyer and a member of Pirate Party movement in Turkey, in fact, we shouldn't be in need of anonymity as a society. Because in Turkey, we really need it. And as a lawyer, I'm assisting my clients and pirate parties establishing services and help with for people who is fighting uh, for their uh, spread for uh, spreading their opinion online but in fact in a utopic world maybe i don't want to be anonymous because i don't want to be in need of uh, being anonymous online because i uh, i I, sh I must be free to express myself in any way if i am not calling for violence or insulting anyone so um, and this is this is my comments and in fact uh, will we have a, another turn or will we have a, another turn yes, yes. yeah and <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm just tweeting people. I'm multitasking. Yeah, thank you. Because uh, we had we had so much uh, in uh, in those hot days, online and offline, of course, and we understood that the ruling government has an anonymous supported uh, supporters on Twitter and the other online platforms, and lo uh, they investigated a lot of people and asked Twitter about their IP addresses and uh, had an agreement with Twitter to obtain those IP addresses because there were lo uh, f lo uh, many uh, user accounts on Twitter that tweeting about the corruption of the government, and Twitter comp uh, complied with many of the uh, government's uh, IP um, requests and we understood that twitter is changing its policy over turkey they came in turkey for two times had uh, um, meetings with government officials and government asked for super tagging in twitter and i think they got it so if there is a there is something on twitter that's not good for the government or in fact not the government the uh, party leader and its relatives the telecom authority turkish official telecom authority can take that tweet uh, is going to be withheld because they have i think they have a super tagging uh, uh, ability on twitter after that meetings and that's Thank all for now Thank you very much, Sehat. Thank you for the first four speakers. I think this is a natural moment because we have been examining through case studies and case law the tension between aspiration and um, everyday reality. And I think the point that anonymity has its place and its role, but we also should have the right, be able to exercise the right to assembly and that assembly can be online and offline. And for anonymity to be required to simply peacefully protest is a sad state of affairs, um, or to be able to express yourself. So I'd like to, any questions from the audience specifically to these panelists, they will note your question, and they will answer them after we've had the final panel, uh, panelists. And please keep your questions brief. I will intervene questions if they go on too long. Thank you. Please identify. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you. My name is Andrei Sherbovich, uh, Russia. Uh, what is uh, how to ensure the balance between the uh, right for privacy and uh, uh, combating against serious crimes on the internet? Okay, I think that question is very clear and very important. We take it. We will respond. Thank you. Any others? To, to Robert, can you tell us uh, the difference, in your opinion, between pseudonymization and anonymization? You are you're speaking. You, you want anonymization. What about pseudonymization? So, <laughs> to, to use pseudonyms instead of anonym being. Yeah. Any other burning questions? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Malte Spitz, my name. I wanted to ask about the issue when it comes to access the internet and using email services. You always have the, um, the amount of metadata who you can't protect at the moment. 
uh, so there is no system, even if you use PGP and so on. So I, I wanted to know if you think that we have to find a new system or develop a new system that leads mm, less metadata so that persons can't be identified that easy. Actually, I think these questions require brief responses, actually. We have one, I think, addressed to Sophie, to Robert. Oh, did you want to add a question? Yeah, okay, one more question, and then we'll have a quick response, just to keep our, um, you know, keep yeah. it um, current in our heads. Uh, Thanks, Marianne. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Selin Karadalan. I'm a lawyer in Turkey. So, uh, I took part of uh, translation of this charter, actually, in Turkish. So, when I was uh, translating, I realized that uh, I thought about the same question, like striking the balance. And uh, one of the exemptions of anonymity is that uh, fighting against serious crimes. So, what's meant by that? What's the serious crime? Because it depends on the country to country. So, yeah, thank you. Actually, thank you, Celine, for actually starting the responses. Thank you very much. Any immediate responses from our panelists to these uh, three questions? Sophie? Yes, thank you. Um, so, about, about the balance, it's, it's indeed difficult. Uh, and speaking about fundamental rights and freedoms, it needs to be a, a judicial uh, way of balancing. Uh, and if you look at the court, there is not enough yet, I just mentioned one case, for this particular topic on anonymity. Uh, but the balancing of the rights with um, the state's interest in ensuring uh, public order, you have a lot uh, of cases which give you some indication on where you strike the, the, the limit. Um, if, if I can just uh, quickly go to this question about the access to internet and, uh, and uh, uh, anonymization. Um, myself, uh, because I'm not uh, sufficiently uh, uh, formed on, on those technologies, I haven't yet adopted them, but I think that all of us uh, should use TOR, should use those tools, because as many of us will use it, this question of ac uh, identifying the person who's acceding to those services will be completely irrelevant if we all use it. Thanks, Sophie. Any responses to our Russian delegate? I'm sorry, I forgot your name. And also perhaps try to start discussing Miriam's questions for us. But as we go, we've got plenty of time. Anyone from the panel would like to respond to these questions from the floor? Oh, Robert, of course. Robert, you have uh, a question to respond to. I'd like to respond to your question. Uh, thank you for that. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so, uh, I, if I understand your question correctly, you're framing anonymity versus pseudonymity, uh, and I would just reframe that as anonymity uh, e and or pseudonymity, Th that the user would have a choice and that the environment would enable that choice, what the socio-technical design of the social network or the, um, the, the uh, registration requirements of, say, participating on a blog or participating um, uh, on a newspaper online uh, without having to use your real name. So I think either of those choices are terrific uh, rather than pit them against each other. Thanks, Robert. That's very um, clear. Miriam, you had a comment, a response? Uh, yes, uh, on this issue of uh, pseudonymity and anonymity, I think the point, uh, the whole point is to define uh, um, towards whom actually you need to be anonymous. If you, use, if you simply use um, pseudonyms, then you can be uh, probably anonymous uh, with respect to the general public, I mean the other uh, users. Uh, this is one kind of anonymity. You also uh, might need, and I very much agree on this, that you need to be uh, anonymous with respect to uh, a service that you use or any intermediary I, I would say. And then there is the anonymity with respect to uh, law enforcement, uh, authorities, police, justice, etc. And then 
the anonymity with respect to intelligence services, which, uh, as we know, has uh, much more means, you know. So uh, there are different cases or different levels of anonymity, and this we could introduce this kind of uh, nu nuance. And there is also the anonymity in which um, activity. So, for instance, I think we could uh, easily reach a whole, uh, general um, a consensus uh, about the fact that we um, must be able to remain anonymous in um, reading, in accessing the information, I would say. Uh, this shouldn't, I don't know of anyone being uh, against this, although, although intelligence services and sometimes uh, the police would like to be able to um, know what you have, uh, which kind of information you access to the internet, or as, or as I mentioned, which kind of uh, book uh, you purchased on, on, the, on the internet. So there are um, a number, I think we should split the issue so that uh, we may probably make some progress, uh, at least on some part of it. Thank you very much, Miriam. Um, I think this is a moment to then turn to the last, uh, our last three speakers who can continue this nuance, analytical distinctions and practical concerns. We're not here to resolve all our problems, just to change the way we think about them at least, perhaps. So I'm going to move now to um, Harriet Kempson from the Youth IGF Project. Harriet, we uh, look forward to your contribution to this debate. Thank you. Hello, I am Harry Kempson with ChildNet's Youth IGF project, as Marianne just said. Um, I am just going to talk about my experience and what, in my experience, people of my age and my peers and my friends think about anonymity and how they use it and what we think about it. So I think that, well, what I've experienced, that what I've seen, is that most people use it to be private from each other to have an, be anonymous among peers. So for example, the Ask FM website, that was very popular with my age group a couple of years back, when we were about 12, 13, that was very popular, to be able to ask questions to each other, but without letting each other know who we were. And it, was, it gave you confidence to ask some questions or to say some things, sometimes negative, but also sometimes positive, if, you don't, if they don't know who you are and your identity is a secret, then you feel more confident, you can't, they won't, there won't be any consequences you feel for that. Last year's Youth IGF survey had over 1,300 people from across 68 countries, and they found that the main reason that young people used um, anonymity, I think it was yeah, 65 of respondents thought that they used it um, to protect personal information. So this reflects the fact that young people do use anonymity and they are worried about people finding out about them and about their personal information. The other main use which I have come across of anonymity by people in my age group is to the, it gives you confidence to ask online chat services or help services for things you may not be comfortable to talk to your parents, your teachers, for example, about bullying there are, lots of, there are lots of services online where you can get advice for that. And also if you're exploring your sexuality or for sexual health. These sort of things, it's very useful to be anonymous because people get embarrassed and it gives you the confidence. It's kind of like a smokescreen to hide behind or if you use a pseudonym or whatever. These sort of things. It's like, as earlier Rob was saying, that if you're anonymous, you're more likely to be honest. And so with these chat services, but they don't know who you are, they don't know anything about you, so you're more likely to confide in them to say what you actually feel rather than what you feel you should say, so you would be judged in the way you might like it to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. To just uh, shift the um, assumption that everything about um, online participation for young people is um, scary and problematic. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure we can return to these cases shortly. I'm going to move now to uh, Nadine Mawad from the Erotics Project, and I'm sure she has some other um, nitty-gritty case studies for us. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I want to build on what uh, Harriet has shared. 
and what Miriam shared before about what sort of anonymity and what are we hiding and from whom. So I work with APC's sexual rights project. Um, it's called Erotics. We started a few years ago exploring the political tensions between internet rights and um, expressions of sexuality. So we looked at the regulation of sexual content and the excuses that are given for that. And we looked at uh, sexual rights movements and how sexual rights activists used the internet to grow their movements in the 80s and the 90s, not 80s, in the 90s and the 2000s, and how they still use the internet today. We have an annual survey, a global monitoring survey, that asks sexual rights activists in particular, and these are women's rights activists, uh, safe abortion activists, LGBT, Q activists, sex education activists, researchers, academics, etc., from all over the world. Um, we ask them about how the internet supports or how censorship and blocking and filtering hinders the work that they do. Um, and what is good is that 98% of the respondents say that uh, the internet's absolutely crucial for sexual rights. Um, so we, we have a, a, a document that we've just launched a couple of days ago called the Feminist Principles of the Internet. And our last principle on it actually has to do with anonymity. It states that it is our inalienable, inalienable right to choose, express, and experiment with our diverse sexualities on the internet, and anonymity enables this. Now the question is why, why is it important to express sexuality on the internet? Um, I think uh, the research that we've done shows how important it was for sexual rights movements to take issues of sexuality from the private sphere into a more public sphere online. And in particular when it came to expression of sexual minorities, women's expression of sexualities, for the LGBT movement it was a lot about connecting, yeah, like Miriam was saying, finding people like me. Um, being able to do so anonymously because in my country I can't be homosexual or transsexual, being able to hide from my parents, being able to hide from my peers or my colleagues, being able to connect in what is a safe environment, uh, or even to go into chat rooms and talk about sex or having sex or ways I like to have sex or curiosities that I have, which are very difficult to talk about in public. Um, even sometimes face to face with people, the same people if I talk to them online and I'm anonymous, I'll feel a little bit safer. So um, I used to run this website called Ask About It for teenagers to ask questions about sex. And I assumed uh, when I first started working with teenagers is that they can find anything online. So why would they need to ask? Yeah, so why would they come and ask me anything when they can just Google it and ask a question? Which is absolutely not true because teenagers need to ask questions all the time, even though it's there. So I started receiving hundreds of questions, mostly from boys. Um, and there were two very popular questions from boys about sex. <laughs> Who can guess what they were? The mind boggles. Please, please educate us. <laughs> there were two of the most frequent questions dozens of the same question every day. So I took that question and I, I highlighted it on the website. So as soon as you enter the website, the question is there with the answer so that they stop emailing me. Because every time I have to reply, blah, blah, blah. So I put the most popular website, uh, question. What is the question? <laughs> <laughs> there, were two, <laughs> there were two very popular questions. The first was, will masturbation hurt me in some way? Does it give me warts? Does it shrink my penis? Will it fall off? Do I get sick? Do I get stupid? Blah, blah, blah. Over and over and over again. A thousand formulations for one question about masturbation. Although if you Google masturbation, you know, you're going to get all these wonderful resources and websites, but yet the kids still needed to ask, right? Because they feel like they got an answer. Um, the second very popular question that boys asked was about something to do with is my penis normal? Some variation of that. Is it curvy? Is it small? Is it big? Is it blah, blah? Um, Girls' questions were a lot less frequent, of course, because, you know, possibly 
we needed to do a bit more to encourage girls to ask, but they were a lot more about social constructions of sex, yeah, a lot less technical about uh, anatomy or height. Um, Anyway, all this to say is that it's really important for kids to be able to ask questions, and it's impossible for kids to do that without anonymity. And what we see today with young people migrating away from Facebook, from sites that capture a lot of their data, from sites where they're obliged to show their data, um, and going more towards private communication on sites where they just, they don't have to deal with their parents watching them or everybody watching them. Um, I wanted to say something also about the importance of anonymity for uh, sexual violence, for combating sexual violence. So, so also the assumption is that if we an anonymize communication about sex, somehow wild, crazy sexual things are going to happen, right? I don't know why. It's the same sort of morality we attach to, to sexuality offline. So if we don't control sex and sexuality, somehow, I don't know what... Nobody's going to do anything productive. Everybody's going to do crazy things. People will, you know, violent things will come out. People will express violent things. Whereas uh, we have seen a number of case studies in Egypt, in Yemen, in Jordan, very recently in Palestine, in Lebanon, in India, in Indonesia, in almost every country possibly, there's been some sort of outburst at some point using an anonymous Tumblr or Twitter to talk about sexual violence. Yes? To come out and say, you know, I was raped, this happened to me, and this is how I feel about it. And of course, this is a complicated discussion because we have to think about um, certain tactics, such as naming and shaming the perpetrators, or, um, you know, becoming then, you know, revealing your identity, and it's a matter of choice, what you want to politicize or publicize. But we saw many such examples of uh, women, especially young women, who come out and talk about violence that's happened to them in institutions, in schools, in universities, at their jobs, on the streets. Um, and being able to be anonymous sort of takes away from who are you, what do you look like, how can I justify this violence that has happened to you, yes? Are you too tall? Are you too short? Are you too skinny? Are you too blonde? Are you too, I don't know, what were you wearing, etc. Um, okay. So being able to be anonymous helped in a lot of ways to put those experiences forward and multiply that sort of let's talk about the violence that happens, let's bring the sexuality out of the taboo and out of the private into the public political sphere. Thank you very much, Nadine. Very, very important additions to the discussion. I'd like to just have our last speaker, please, and then we will open up for discussion about the issues arise, arising right now. So Tapani, a pretty hard act to follow, but I'm sure you can manage. Atapani Tavenev from Electronic Frontier, Finland. Okay, thank you. Now this time you got the foundation name right. It's not Electronic Frontier Foundation at all. We are distinct from Electronic Frontier Foundation, Electronic Frontier, Finland. Okay, just so people have mostly been talking about what kind of anonymity we should have from legal and ethical perspectives. I'll try to look at it from a little bit from the technical side, what kind of anonymity we actually can have. I'm not going to any deep details, just some general observations. At, from a technical viewpoint, anonymity, just as in law actually, it's not an absolute thing, something you either have or don't. In reality, there is no such thing as perfect anonymity, it's always relative. And it's relative in at least two dimensions. In what you are doing, what, you, what it is you want to do anonymously, hide. And who you are trying to hide it from. For examples, if you just want to send a single message out so that your neighbors or friends won't find out it's from you, that's pretty easy. Although perhaps not quite as easy as you might think. It takes some care. But if you want to maintain a long-standing anonymous or pseudonymous identity so that even the police won't know who you are, that's very hard, as some members of the famous anonymous with capital A found out. And if you try to lead a normal internet life with all social media stuff and whatnot, 
and still keep the NSA from knowing who you are. That's impossible. And there's also significant difference in being anonymous privately, so to speak. Just doing your thing, say, looking for sensitive inf information from the web without anybody knowing that you're doing that. And just hoping that nobody will find that you're doing that at all. And versus, versus trying to maintain an anonymous but public image. Say, broadcasting some message, spreading it out to the everybody, even though the powers that be try to actively suppress you and hunt you down. That's much harder. Well, I don't think I have much more to say at this point, but I just highlight that you shouldn't ask just, how can I be anonymous in the net? You must ask, how anonymous can I be? And how anonymous do I need to be? Or perhaps, how much anonymity you're willing to pay for? Not so much in money, but in the time and trouble it takes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tapani. That is extremely um, important to shift the question. Thank you. Has everybody got that subtle shift in how anonymous can I be? Just to emphasize. Okay, let's just take a breath. I see a question from the floor already. Uh, thank you to my panelists. I think we'll just open it up a bit more a forum. I will collect two or three questions just so we get them on the record and we'll see how we go, okay? So um, from the floor, yes, hand in the air. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I was invited, my name is Ebru Itishkin, I'm from Istanbul Technical University and uh, I, am, I am invited here to participate to, the, to this event as a speaker, one of the speakers. And I was made uh, anonymous. And it's kind of foolish for me to, to, to experience and to participate in, a, in an event right now um, to um, to see the, the clash between anonymity, uh, design, and decision making. So um, I just would like to remind you that, and uh, I am not complaining, I am just trying to make a point here, just to uh, reveal the fact of in micro uh, moments in our everyday life, we are experiencing this problem, and uh, this is going through decision makers and decision-making mechanisms. And uh, I have a speech, and uh, if you give me the floor, I would like to talk about uh, some other problems. Thank you. Um, Abel, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Yes, you can use mine if you want. Uh, I think uh, there has been a misunderstanding, so we would like to clear this up immediately. Thank you, Robert. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for your participation here. Um, I just want to speak to um, feelings of anonymity. Um, with the process, I organized this panel, and the process of putting a panel together, panelists, uh, requires confirmation of speakers. And if, um, if the organizer does not get confirmation of speaker, it's very difficult to um, assess who is going to be there uh, for, for planning purposes. But I do um, uh, feel for you, and I apologize if there are any hurt feelings there. I'd like to invite you two to speak as well um, and to put forward uh, what you would want to contribute. The floor is yours. Three minutes, as everybody else. So off you thank go. You. Well, thank you. Um, I, uh, I only would like to make um, two, three uh, basic uh, comments about the topic because it's, I think it's a huge problem. Um, First is to give the emphasis on protecting. And this is uh, manipulated, this discourse of protection and security is, um, is uh, appropriated by the big government and big corporations and the governments. This is my main argument, one of my main arguments. The second is uh, designing anonymity is uh, presented, represented as a, a problem uh, between big corporations and uh, governments versus public or crowds. But uh, we see that, we are experiencing that, and I can give you many, many cases. Uh, we are experiencing that there are also clashes between uh, governments and um, uh, big corporations. Uh, so 
by changing the discourse uh, of uh, protecting and security by openness, participating and uh, sharing and uh, openness, we need to um, know more about how um, protection or anonymity is used by the governments and by the uh, corporations, big corporations. In order to design participation culture, we need to learn more about uh, how anonymity is used by the states and by the governments and by the big corporations. But the problem is we do not have the, the information. We do not have enough information about their design and culture. And because their design and culture is uh, is made anonymous. So not everyone uh, during the decision-making mechanism or in designing mechanism within the big corporations, such as Google or Google uh, or Google <laughs> or you, Yahoo or whatever, um, not even a single person who uh, has the whole structure. So that is another problem that I would like to raise. Um, I think it's finished, three minutes. Thank you. you, you of course, you can. We're all we're all here to join, and thank you. I think that's a very important uh, nuance in how we're talking about anonymity here. The sort of anonymous forces behind the screens that are, you know, and this isn't just a spooky science fiction movie. Mm -hmm. The fact we don't know who's doing what to our data most of the time. And I think Miriam made that point in another frame earlier on. Okay, so thank you very much, Abu, and I'm glad you made it here, thank you. Not all emails get through, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a, a comment, question from the floor then, Jack. Anybody else, just to get a line up? Okay, first of all, Jack, I'll try and keep an eye, can you help me? So, yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, uh, stress the uh, information that uh, in different countries, in different uh, segments of the web, there, are different, there is different situation. Maybe I would be in favor uh, of uh, doing anything to ensure freedom on the internet. But uh, Russian segment of the internet called Runet, there is uh, very big problems with the criminality in the network. Uh, especially, you know, that, that uh, through the one of the popular social networks, there is child porn uh, distributed openly uh, and free of charge by uh, people using uh, 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 pseudonyms and uh, an anonymous accounts. Do you have a question to ask? Is all this a comment? Uh, the question is uh, how, to, how to deal with this. How to deal with this in case of uh, situation with different countries. Thank you. Okay, point is very well taken. I think we'll hear another question slash comment, and I think the panelists might want to respond. And there was one other, I think, a third. Okay, so Jack, please, thanks. Um, actually, my comment is probably in response to your question because you asked earlier how to balance between um, anonymity and also to address crime. And I think that always comes up when you talk about anonymity, but what about the criminals and how do we catch them? We do a lot of work on violence against women as well as sexuality. And on issues of violence against women, we are also always looking for recognition that this is happening, that you know a lot of threats and stuff um, are being targeted, and often this is coming from an anonymous um, or an unnamed mob online. However, we also recognize that the principle of anonymity is so critical for individual safety and for us to be able to exercise a range of our rights that you cannot use that as a trade-off between security. And the principle here is around proportionality and the default. So the default should always be from the principle of anonymity because of how important it is. And then that should tr trickle through everything in terms of how we design technology, in in terms of the norms that um, inform our laws and in terms of the culture of communications that we perpetuate online. And then, when we want to think about what are the exceptions to which we, have, we can remove the right to anonymity, then you have like, quite clear standards around, you know, you have to think about rule of law, you have to think about to what extent is this actually addressing the problem, that's where research comes in, rather than the other way around. Because right now, I think we are pushing towards the other way around, we are going like this kind of like, you know, anonymity is really dangerous and we have all kinds of 
of like moral anxieties and panic that's being thrown around that's not really grounded on any particular form of like um, um, clear research, which is what is being shared here, which I really appreciate. Thank you very much, Jack. Fine. Just before we move to the next question, is that this theme? Can we just sort of follow this theme through a little bit before we bring in another question? Or as any panelists want to respond to do with you know fighting crime? Nobody wants to have criminals uh, around. So Tapani, and then we'll move to the next set of questions. Yeah, just a general observation that uh, there is crime everywhere always and always has been. And it's an uh, act of balance. But we also have to realize that sometimes citizens need to be protected from the state. The state is not necessarily always in the right. And one way is that it, it should not be too easy for the state to crack down on anonymity, even technically. It should be possible if you have real need, but if it's too easy, then it will be used to repress activity that should not be illegal. Yes, so states should not be able to get away with everything. So we have at the back a question, then we'll follow with the two here, okay? We just gather those questions, or questions please. Okay, um, a lot of what the previous two speakers actually resonates with, uh, what I said, can you hear me? Okay, so, um, I'm stuck between a question and a comment. Um, my name is Juliet. I'm from CIPESA. That's the Collaboration for International ICT Policy, uh, policy rather, in Eastern Southern Africa. Now, um, my issue is we recently launched an initiative that's pursuing the right to information in uh, Uganda. The trick has come in that in order to access that information, you have to give your details as one would when they physically go into a governmental office. Um, so on the issue of anonym anonymity, that is uh, something that has come to the fore because a lot of the people whom we've engaged with are not keen on giving out the information based, as, rather, as a result of uh, previous uh, experiences that have come out through the media of uh, people being found out, rather people's identities coming out uh, through various, uh, I don't know, engagements or rather various sources, as, um, rather government, government engagements. So um, my thinking is, um, at least back home, we still have a bit of a way to go with uh, coming to understanding, rather to reaching an understanding about anonymity and accessing information and uh, you know, just uh, keeping the peace as it were. Thanks. Thanks. That recalls uh, Miriam's earlier point about anonymity being not necessarily always the same as identity, but the collection of key data about you before you access kind of compromises your chances of moving around. Um, the next two questions, I believe, uh, yes, Carmen, and if you, or do you want to go first? Okay. Well, I think, sure. yeah, we are, we are both lawyers, so... Just a little note, we really need to speak very close into the speaker because it's very hard to hear otherwise. Into the microphone, sorry. Okay, so mine is not so much as a question, uh, but about this serious core concerns about crimes and, and uh, versus anonymity. Uh, so, um, there are, these are quite baseless fears, however, in order to argument against those, we do need evidence-based research, as you just men mentioned before. However, it's very hard to come by, uh, but we do have it, actually. We do have it from South Korea, who had a real name policy from 2007 till 2012. And the outcome of that before the Constitutional Court of South Korea said that, well, this is unconstitutional to have real name policy, was that the number of comments in news platforms dropped more than 50%. However, the number of bad comments, let's say it like that, were basically defamatory uh, comments, th those dropped from 15.8% to 13.9%. So the drop of the so-called, what, what, the, what they wanted to fight against was basically invisible. So however, I think we all here agree that anonymity in any form, anonymity or pseudonymity or just identity questions are something very, very similar to human rights. However, the difficulty is that we don't really have it in a law. Uh, it's, it's very hard to say it out loud without getting counter arguments. So we have two options. We either have it in a law, as Germany has done it, they have it in the Media Act, saying that you have a right to be anonymous on the internet, and you, you have to be allowed to, allowed to do that. Or, and the second, we need to raise literacy, uh, people's literacy, and this is also very well uh, taken together by uh, the Constitutional Court of Germany in a Spikmich case that was a 
our teachers' portal and the comments, the anonymous comments on that portal. And the court said that, well, the reader must use a common sense and understand that anonymous speech on the internet is not encyclopedia. It is a very subjective and very often robust, and the re it's a reader's obligation to use common sense. Thanks, Carmen. Thank you very much. And con continuing around the table, please. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just wanted to uh, connect some of the points that were made, um, in particular by Miriam, and uh, also just here about um, the need to differentiate uh, different kinds of situations when you're talking about anonymity. Um, so I think we speak about the monolithic concept of anonymity, but there are you know, different kinds of anonymity as a customer of uh, the ISP or the uh, application provider, uh, anonymity vis-a-vis -vis the state, uh, anonymity from the other customers in the platform. So th these are three different types of anonymity, and we should start speaking about these uh, specific issues. And also, uh, it shouldn't be monolithic in the sense, okay, uh, you should always have the right to anonymity in these uh, situations. You should look into what anonymity is serving for. So what is the ultimate right that you're trying to protect with anonymity? And uh, the case law of uh, the European Court of Human Rights and other um, human rights court uh, has said that in, in certain situations, you know, uh, there are rights that are more important than others. For example, uh, right to protect uh, the right to life, you know, um, protect, you know, against in, an interference with the right to life is more important than uh, the right to privacy in certain situations. So uh, if you uh, have uh, obvious um, impossibility of pursuing cases where uh, someone might uh, risk their own life, uh, you know, uh, you need to have the possibility as a state to secure protection against that. So if you don't have a data retention program uh, whereby ISPs have the log uh, where they can keep track of what, what's happening, uh, you, you are not able to uh, protect against this kind of uh, violation of rights. So what I'm, I'm saying, just to, to wrap up, is uh, we cannot have total anonymity. We just need to have very specific, uh, clear, and um, due process respect in procedures uh, to assess the data. But we do need the data to, to exist if we want to protect all the rights. Thank you very much. This is a very important point. We have two more questions and then we are, because of time, I'm going to ask the panel, I'm just preparing the panel, to provide a takeaway, a one line, the last thought, you know, the last thing you would like this room to think about, not a long speech. So you've got some time to think and I will be asking in reverse order so, um, just to warn you, so two more questions from the floor, and there might be some need to be some responses to those, but let's just hear what you have to say. So it was first Catherine, and then um, um, Bertrand. Hi. Um, please identify yourself for the record. I'm, I'm Catherine Easton from the University of Lancaster in the UK. Um, I was very struck by um, Tapani's statement in relation to you get the level of anonymity that you pay for. And I wonder what the panel think about whether we are developing a socioeconomic divide in relation to anonymity with the anonymity haves and the anonymity have nots, the ones who can pay for the level of hardware and software that protects their online activities and also be educated to the extent that they are protected online. That was my quick question. Thanks, Catherine. And Bertrand? Um, well, I, I was actually very happy to um, see uh, a teen person in the panel because um, teens and children are very, very important. Um, there are, are a special audience um, that we should, I mean, crime is also very important, but I think that um, teen activities online are very important and they're the pro protected audience. Now, Dana Boyd has done extensive research on uh, how teens use social networks while protecting their anonymity. Um, and I, I would like to ask especially um, to you to, you know, share with us some of the strategies um, that teens and kids use to remain in social network, to remain anonymous or pseudonymous, uh, pseudonymous uh, in social networks, like some of the strategies that um, are prevalent among teens. Thanks. I think, Harriet, would you like to respond? Well, um, lots of the 
people who are trying to be anonymous online will use the anonymous services like Ask, S like, like Ask FM, which is automatically anonymous if you're friends with the person. And for the like chat for help websites, that's often anonymous already. So I have heard from being at this conference that there are ways of covering up your identity in everything you do, in cover it, but it sounds like it's a lot of work and very few people do it. And personally, I don't know anyone else who goes through all the effort of using special search engines and disabling cookies and working out how to stay completely anonymous. So I think mainly people I know who try to be anonymous will maybe on Tumblr use a name, a pseudonym for their like strapline thing or will use the website set up to be anonymous rather than actively seek out ways to hide who they are. Thank you. Right, we have five, well, a few more minutes. Um, I'd like to invite the panel, beginning with um, Tapani as our, final, uh, our last speaker, just to make a final comment, given the um, very uh, rich material and ideas we've had today. The transcript will provide all of us with a chance to reflect and read it later. So Tapani, if you had one thing left to say, which you do, I only have one thing left to say right now, what would it be? Actually, I'd like to reply to Catherine's point. It's always been the case that the rich and the powerful have more anonymity than the normal people, or more privacy, so to speak. But the technical issues in the internet actually would make it possible to reverse this trend. It would be possible. It's now much uh, technically, it's uh, financially cheaper to have privacy and anonymity in the net than it has been in the pre-internet era, but it's not actually going to the other direction, as you quite well observed, that the tendency is to erode the anonymity of the small people and give anonymity and privacy only to the rich and powerful and the corporations, as noted. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Tapani. And moving to Nadine. Um, I think the point about the different levels of anonymity that you've raised, are very, it's very important. And across all of these... Um, we, we can agree that disabling anonymity or what we have now in terms of privatization of the internet and ourselves and our identities and the currency we have to constantly pay. Every time we log online, we have to pay with information about us. I have to put a real picture, a real relationship status, my real feelings, my real interactions, where I really am, all of these things. I think the internet is designed now in a way to like extract as much data and information about us as is possible. And the point about literacy is quite important because we might say, oh, well, people have the choice to make, right? They are choosing to reveal this information. But the truth is that a lot of internet users have no idea where they're sending this data, have no idea that they have no right over it anymore, that they can't delete it permanently, that it can be used for a number of reasons. And um, so I think across the board of the different levels of anonymity, um, it's quite important that we hold on to this, and like Robert said at the beginning, to push for it to become, to elevate it to a right. Thank you. Uh, oh gosh, I can't, I've forgotten how to count backwards. Harriet. <laughs> I think what's, I think the main thing which has struck me in this discussion is that anonymity means lots of different things to lots of different people and people use it for very different things. So there's both the criminal and the political side of things. Then there's also the helplines and the having the confidence to talk to people you may not normally talk to. So I think anonymity is quite a broad word, means things to different people, and is used for a lot of different things. And Abu, our, um, would you like to make a final comment? I think we need to think more about designing the next internet rather than designing <laughs> anonymity with the principles of um, the notion of anonymity that we are talking about right now today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And moving to Sehat Coach. Thank you. And I want to, in fact, give you examples of 
uh, using anonymity by the evil forces like the government because uh, we clearly see that the only reliable information to obtain uh, for people living in Turkey, not only Turkish people, the people living in Turkey is through social media and alternative news sites, Facebook groups and especially Twitter had become crucially important for many people because the people of Turkey thought that Twitter is an anony anonymous place to express their opinions uh, and that's led our top politicians uh, to condemn sites like Twitter as a tool used for extremists and because they were anonymous there and they were they were they can they will be able to express themselves and uh, protest the government and so on uh, during the hate of the Gezi Park protests last June Erdogan declared social media is the worst menace to society because they couldn't understand it right at that uh, uh, time and Facebook is ugly technology that's their words, ugly technology, and they figured out that they can use it, in fact. If the extremists are using it anonymously for protesting the government, so we can use it, and rather than the crackdown on social media, their party initially chose to fight fire with fire. This summer, the party reportedly enlisted around 6,000 anonymous online volunteers to boost its presence online and of course via digital bullying uh, anonymously on people protesting or expressing themselves they are against the government's uh, actions so recently we were uh, able to raise the interest of people have been contacting us and uh, me as a lawyer of course through social media to seek advice on using the internet more anonymously in turkey and last uh, sentences so we are developing projects for secure communication in Turkey, including local uh, establishing local mesh networks, which are primitive networks of interconnected wireless routers that allow people to communicate relatively free via the internet, despite government and uh, private sectors' efforts, efforts to suppress access. And also, we are building a whistleblowing platform, a software for journalists living in Turkey, because currently whistleblowers in Turkey barely ever leak to journalists, because anonymity software and understanding is not widely used and uh, took place in Turkey. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Very important for us to remember this. Uh, two minutes, three speakers. Um, uh, Miriam? Okay, two words then. Uh, First of all, I had two questions that uh, remain uh, unanswered, so I hope that uh, next IGF will be <laughs> another workshop on anonymity. But the uh, summary in two words, first of all, nuancing, and I already uh, uh, discussed this. And second, I'm all for uh, anonymity uh, online. but. I'm not using personally, in my personal use of the, the internet and even, even the social network, I am never anonymous. Uh, I should say that I mainly use social network for political discussion, etc. And I think it's a fundamental aspect of democracy to express opinion freely and also in your own name. And in the end, we should uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, an opinion or discourse is uh, probably uh, uh, more um, come on, credible. Yeah. Credible. Uh, more credible if there is a name and uh, uh, and uh, an, an affiliation or uh, positions openly uh, uh, shown than when the discourse is completely anonymous. So we should also keep this in mind. Yes, our real names should not become a criminal act using our real names. Thank you. Um, and Sophie, followed by Robert, we have a couple more minutes only, so let's just finish up. Thank you. Yeah, same thing. I can only agree with this need for a nuance, for differentiation in, in the types of anonymities. Uh, myself, for instance, I do not need to be anonymous towards my community. I do not need to be anonymous towards the state. But I would like, for instance, to be anonymous from the private sector. Uh, I believe in do not track. Uh, I really hope that technology can give us uh, this, uh, uh, this support we need in, uh, in uh, enforcing what is our right. Thank you very much. Technology that enforces what is our right. I like that. It's a great sentence. Thank you, Sophie. And Robert, your final note, and then I'll just wrap up in 10 seconds. 
I, I have the tendency to wrap up as well, but um, I'll try and avoid that. Um, one sentence. Um, I believe that uh, when uh, we look at how surveillance practices of data gathering methods um, are shared among intelligence, law enforcement, and e-commerce, where the practices are so intertwined, is it really useful to split the issue? So I leave it at there. That anonymity should be um, a cross-cutting right. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'd just like to thank our panelists. I'd like a great round of applause to both yourselves and the panelists. Before you go, we have the Turkish translation of the charter here and in the booths, around the booths, and plenty of English versions here in my bag. So feel free to come and collect. They are still free for use. Thank you.